Good morning, heart and soul. Good morning. Good morning. So this is yet another stop on our adventure in faith. This moment in time is simply our opportunity to, to look more deeply at what is, what's happening, and to whom is it happening? What, if anything, is happening, and to whom? Who are you in this experience? We're gonna have, we're gonna take our time with this. Today, I feel like is, is probably an initial installment, and really, I have been inspired by my brother Amon and in, um, from his talks for the past two weeks. So I'm going to be drawing liberally from that, if not literally, at least in the way that it intersect, the way that it intersects my own knowing. And those places that I want to, I want to expand. I want to begin though by acknowledging and giving thanks. I, this is my first time in the pulpit speaking since the end of August. No, yes, I did. I spoke that Sunday and then I was on a plane that night to Bali. And so this is my first time and a lot has happened for me since then. You know, I feel like I should, allow me to introduce myself. <laughs> <laughs> the new me, you know? I, there's a part of me that feels like, they don't know me. I need to be introduced to these people. Because there is just the decision to go um, and uh, to be a part of a group and go, just so many things were so, so different. It was my opportunity to to step out beyond the choices I might have made without that decision to do it different. Does that make sense? Yeah. So I might look, the, no, I don't even look the same, huh? Now that I think about it, I was about to say, forgetting, because I don't see me right now. Yeah, I do over there. Um, that, you know, I might look the same, but I don't even look the same. Oh, I love this. I love this. It's putting my life, the fullness of my life on notice. That it's different. Yes, this leg of the adventure in faith is different. Now, let me just, because when I was here and introduced Amon and the fact that he is now a part of our staff ministry, our ecclesiastical team, um, I shared with y'all that it's my intention to pull a group of folks together for Bali, if you're interested. So email me at Rev Andriette, where is it, what has it got, Rev Andriette at heartsoulcenter.org. Um, if you're interested, let me know for 24, not 2024 or 2025 because I'm looking at what could happen and how we could do it and who and how many, that kind of thing. So there's that. But first of all, what I want to say is thank you. Thank you for the folks who showed up during all of September. Thank you for the folks who created the situation, circumstance in such a way that there was something for which to show up. So I'm grateful for the in-person and virtual service teams, because y'all kept it rocking the entire time. It just goes to show you how little I need to be involved here. <laughs> I'm just saying, you know what I mean? And, and the, the, the mastery and ability for our virtual hosts, they just kept it going our hospitality teams, our welcome circle, facilities and beautification, divine flow, music ministry, our prayer and care village, none of them needed me to do not a thing, praise God. <laughs> and so I'm grateful. I also want to acknowledge Reverend Angelo, Reverend Jack, 
Reverend D. Jacqueline, and Reverend Amon times two. Just, this is sometimes, it, it can be a challenge for the founder. My sense is in anything. Because so much of the way we see the thing, it looks like it's ours to do. It looks like the whole thing, it can look like that. It can feel like the whole thing is my responsibility. I've been rebirthed. And so that, that sense of that it has everything to do with what I do and what I say and how I do it and how I say it, what I see is that we are, and I'm sure we've been here for forever, and now I see and experience how the village is handling the village's business. Lord knows I'm grateful for the scales falling from my eyes. So look, today I want to begin with Mark 11, 22 through 24. Amon worked with this some, and it's on my heart. It's here that this is, the way we know this scripture is this power that each of us has to speak to the mountain and have the mountain be gone. Now, when I grew up, and I don't know if this is true for y'all, I believe they were really talking about a mountain. You know, and then I also grew up in an environment where the teaching was, if you're good enough, if you're worthy enough, if God has smiled on you, then you can speak to and about and have change in your life. That ain't it at all. But I understand how we concluded that. Instead, what I want to, the, the stage I want to set for this scripture is that who we are, who each of us is, who I am, who you are right now, is sufficient. It's sufficient. Now, you are loved exactly, loved and accepted exactly as you are. Truly, truly. And you're going to have to change. You, I wanted that to bake in for a moment, but I didn't want you to get too out of order. You, do, do you understand that both things are true? That you are whole, perfect, and complete as you are. And if you draw one more breath, you will have to change. Because that was then. Now you still have that as your natural makeup, as the truth of who you are. And in order to hang out at a vibration that is more to your liking in your ability to create all that you desire to create, meaning in who you be, and what you do and what you have, you're going to have to change. Because the vision is always in the future. The desire, the energetic of what I want. And we all want something. I know many of us are quite satisfied. And we want something. We want a modicum of health and well-being. We want enough prosperity to travel with me when we go. We want, we, whatever it is we desire, you know, the peace, the sense of security, whatever it is, we must change in order to have that be our mental, emotional, and spiritual equivalent. We must be the vibration that operates at the level of whatever our desire is because our desire is like the engine of it. Our desire is the thing that, that vibrates. It's like, oh my God, what I'm picturing in my mind's eye is, is like a, oh, can y'all see this? Yeah, y'all can see this. If I can see it, y'all can see it. So look here. Like one of those domed, a, a glass dome. But within this glass dome is, let's say it's steamy, smoky, so you're not necessarily able to see anything but the atmosphere of it. Does that make sense if I say it like that? So you're looking through a glass darkly. <laughs> so, so right there, what you see, you're peering in so that you can see what's there. Now your desire to see what's there lights it up. 
You, you see, it's, it's like an aspect of physics that until you do something, ain't nothing happening. So you as the observer causes something to be revealed. The fact that you are present and desirous of seeing what's in here. Now, if you don't peer, if you don't peer into it, then you'll see nothing. <laughs> Even though there's something there. Now, I don't have to tell you that throughout our lives, our lives are littered with those situations where we just know and we haven't even looked. It is in the looking, in the peering, in the interacting that it begins to be revealed to us, that it is then available to us. Does this make sense? Okay, so in this particular scripture, it begins, and I have, if, if it's, oh, it is up there, good. So there's two versions that I'm playing with. I always begin with the Peshitta and the, the English translation of that. And then I, I sometimes go to the American Standard Version, which is what Ernest Holmes used consistently in his work. So when he quotes Bible, he's using that particular version. What I like about the Peshitta is that I know that the original writings were not in English. And because I have tried to speak some other languages, I have sense enough by my own experience to know that everything does not translate. And so even though there is value to this written word, there is no reason, no intelligent, no reasonable reason, no reasonable reason. Hmm. There you go, that's true though. No reasonable reason for us to believe that we should accept it as an exact translation. Because first of all, it isn't. Let me just, let me just go there. Let me just say that full stop, it isn't. And so this notion, what, what I loved, one of the first things I discovered was that in the Peshitta, which is drawn from the Aramaic, it is saying, may the faith of God be in you. Yeah. Now in the American Standard, it says, have faith in God. Wow. Now we can see that those are similar ideas, but for some of us, they mean something different. They, they sit different. So I'm going to encourage you to go with what rocks you. Okay? So whatever it is, and it's a personal preference. I'm not selling any. I don't have any stock in no Bible stuff. So it's, it's what resonates for you. What opens you up so that you can begin to see beyond. And sometimes when we look at them in to contrast and compare, that in itself opens something. Why? Because like the law of physics, we are peering into it. We're now looking, and it's not until you look that something else can be revealed. Why would something else be revealed to you and you not even looking? Now, you know that doesn't make sense. So it is in your looking, in your peering, in your, in your depth, in your desire to see something more. What does this mean, Lord? What does, oh, for that one, something else can be revealed. And if you already know it all, then you're excused. Because there's nothing we don't need. You don't need nothing else revealed for you if you already know it all. If you come asking, though, come available to it, seeking. If you come seeking, you'll find. Because there's an energy within the seeking that is also finding. Yes? Okay. So look, this is where I'm going to get to. I always thought that this was really about a mountain. You know, like... Mount Shasta. <laughs> that if I really had my life together spiritually, I could go up to Mount Shasta and come. Now, you can see that that's a child's mind regardless of one's age. Not, it's not an age <laughs> distinction. It's about spiritual maturity and understanding. Yes, does this make sense? Okay. So, in truth... What it's talking about are the mountains in your life. Now, in the vernacular, we don't tend to call them the mountains. We call them the mess. We call them the drama. What we call them? Y'all tell me, what you call it? The stuff, the problems. If you're advanced, you try to call it the challenges. Yes, I understand the what? The issues, the drama. 
The what? Yeah. Them. Them. We call it them. So, so we know we have our names. Scripture calls it mountain. That's what it's talking about. It's not talking about earth and snow and, you know, we're not talking out in nature mountain. We're talking about the mountains in your life. The stuff that you can't see past in order to be who you're supposed to be. In order to do what you're supposed to do. In order to have what is rightfully yours to have, but you are not vibrating at the level of the thing that would otherwise be yours. Why? Because you got the mountain blocking your vibration. So the mountain is our stuff. And the idea of this scripture is that there's a point in your energetic presence when you can speak to that stuff. It's a get thee behind me moment, isn't it? Look, stuff. You better get, what? And you, it's you talking to you. Because you realize you're still tripping. You see the person and you can't. I was watching something. And in this something, you see the person like all the machinations that would have you not speak. You know, like, ooh, my shoe. You understand what I'm saying? Yes. That is a sign that the mountain is there. See, I'm not judging you. I'm not criticizing you. I'm help. I'm giving you a Dakota ring. This is your metaphysical Dakota ring. When you find you in tripology, that's all of the stuff where we know we're tripping. Now, other folks don't know your tripology. So they don't necessarily know you tripping. But you know you tripping. You know you tripping. You know you trying not to. You know you pretending to. You know you, you know you. So the decoder ring, your metaphysical decoder ring, is that when you catch you tripping, you realize that you must develop your capacity for speaking to that mountain. And what does it say? It says that when we do, we'll, not, we'll say to the mountain, be lifted up and fall into the sea. Now, you don't have to use those words because it's get out of here. Translation, you better get on out of here. Get out of my face. Y'all have heard that before. You better get out of my face. This is you speaking to the drama. This is you speaking to the mess. This is you speaking to them. This is you speaking to the stuff. You better get up out of here. And then if you like my mama, you start counting. And I don't know how, she never told us how far she was going to count. Because she never had to. It was the beginning of the counting. We, we never, ever found out what was going to be the last number. Because I didn't want to know. And your stuff doesn't want to know from you. When you come with that, because it's an energetic presence, isn't it? And you're speaking something into being. Now, here's the thing that it's telling us. When we can, not can, when we do that, because we can do it. When we acknowledge our capacity, our ability to do it, and we do it, it's at that point that, what does it say? That anything that you pray and ask, because that's a prayerful experience in all of that. You are, it's, it's a statement of realization, of recognition and declaration. Believe that you are receiving it and you shall have it. Now, the other translation says, believe that you receive it and you shall have it. I don't care what you like. Just get one. <laughs> get one that you can, with, with which you can resonate so that you begin to shift your life in the ways that matter to you. Yes? Okay. So look. 
Aman offered us an idea, and then in my, so I want to talk about faith, because that's what this is about. Absence, a sense of faith, a critical mass knowing. You understand what I'm saying? I want, I'm still thinking on some level that faith is like congealed belief. You know what I mean? It's like if we awakened you out of a deep sleep. And I love Valerie Joy. You and Tammy created that, our chant for our devotional. God is all there is. Oh, that's lovely. If only we believed it. I mean, we, we just, oh, we fall into just such a sweet place with that. And your beautiful voice and Tammy's playing. It is beautiful. Too bad we don't believe it. Too bad we're just humming along and feeling it. I know we don't believe it because the world would be different if we did. Our individual lives, the collective energetic of that, as citizens of the world, the world would be different because we'd be speaking a different energy into the world. So I guess we're just going to keep playing it till we believe it. Till we come to believe that truly God is all there is. So look, I, I'm pretty visual. I'm a visual learner. So, you know, I bring y'all vision. And visual images. So look, out of what Amon shared with us when he was here in person, he talked about realization um, in part as a step in treatment. That first we recognize the divine, the whole, the all in all. We recognize that God is all there is. And then within that, there's a, a, well, there's a unification also that we're a part of that. And then there's the realization of what that means. So it's almost if you, no, I'm not going there because that's not the point. So look, what Amon said to us is that when we think about realization, he offered us that within realization, he concluded, he discerned that it included receive, have, accept. And we got that. He, he took us through it. That in order to realize the thing, I mean, we say we, like, we realize God is all there is. Well, not unless we are receiving that. Have we received that God is all there is? I'm going to answer for us, no. Because if we did, there'd be a different vibration everywhere we go. Everywhere we go. And I'm not arguing with any individual about where they are on the continuum of that awareness. What I know is that there... <clears throat> I already said what I know, so look. He said, receive, we would receive it, that God is all there is. And that reception, there'd be something about us having that. We have that as a part of our being. Does that make sense? That it wouldn't just be a thing you said, you would have that. And my sense is that people would just be stopping you on BART saying, what? <laughs> What? Because there's, what, what is that? Because I saw you coming down the escalator. And there was such a light. There, I can't even tell you what I saw. But you're going to have to tell me something. Y'all do don't. Okay, look. And then there is the acceptance of it. The acceptance of it, not just the, I know, I already know that. It would be the acceptance of it, where it's a part of your chemicalization. Your cells are bathed in it. Does this make sense? Okay. All right, so look. Then when I was looking at Ernest Holmes in the Science of Mind textbook around faith, in his discourse, he says that faith, the, the components in faith similarly are belief, acceptance, and trust. 
And I was like, y'all need to just hook up, you, Amon and Ernest. Just Y'all just get together and do a thing. And then I thought, well, just in case they don't know to do that, I'll just do it for them. I'll just put them together so that we can have a sense of how close we already are, how the thing is happening in us, for us, through us, according to our willingness to honor it, to acknowledge it, <clears throat> pardon me, to acknowledge it and honor it. Oh, Lord. Huh. <laughs> oh, Lord. Um, so one of the things, just, just <laughs> full disclosure, one of the things I decided with the new me is that she don't talk as long. <laughs> but apparently she's been influenced by the old me. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a little disturbed to find this out because I had planned for my entire, everything I shared with you to happen in the amount of time I've already spent. So I'm trying to reconcile that right now because I got another whole section and I'm not through with this yet. <sighs> so do we have snacks? <laughs> do, we, do, we have a, do we have a contingency plan for me? Oh, Father, Mother, God. Okay, let's see what we can. Oh, Father, okay. Because um, I can't do it all. I'm not going to, let's do this. I'm not even going to try to do all of this today. Today. Because I prepared it, but I really didn't know for when. So look at here. This I am going to do. Shoot. And then we're going to have a song. So here's what we're going to do. Is I'm going to ask y'all to start coming up. Because even I have sense enough to know to go sit down when the band gets up there and the people start, you know. And then kind of Val just, or whoever's do a little something to just, you know how they, you know how they do the minister. <laughs> Y'all know what to do. Do the minister in the way they do the minister. So look, but I got to tell you, this notion of the mental equivalent, often when I speak to it, I always, you know, I do the whole thing. It's the mental, it's the emotional, and often what is emotional, especially in, in uh, scripture, is heart. When the heart is mentioned, it's about the emotional. So it's the mental, emotional, and spiritual equivalent. That's our vibration. So Ernest Holmes says in the Science of Mind Glossary, says that having a subjective idea, which is a particular idea, okay? A particular idea of the desired experience. This is you knowing for you that you have a vision, you have a desire, you want something, but you got to be specific. You don't just want it better. There's a specific uh, arrangement that when you have that, you go, oh, now that's better. You see what I'm saying? It's very specific. He says, as we bring ourselves to a greater vision than the range of our present concepts, we can then induce, we can create a greater concept. So we have to, we have to expand beyond what is and quit focusing on what is. Quit focusing on the prognosis. Quit focusing on the discomfort. Quit focusing on that. You see? And thereby demonstrate more in our experience. So look, who's going to do this? Yeah, well, we the ones. We the ones. The heart and soul community is who I'm counting on. And that's broad. That includes y'all at home and the person who tricked you into tuning in or whatever happened. All all y'all, we are the ones. So who, who are the ones? We are. So we are the ones. Thank you, Destiny, for, for those lyrics, for all of it. Thanks, all of y'all, for, for all of it, specifically for the lyrics. Love, 
Lead. Believe it. Love. Lead. Achieve it. That's your call to action. That's your call to action. I know that sometimes, you know, for years I had a, a practitioner and coaching practice. And very often what I might hear from clients is, well, what about so-and-so? And, you know, I'd want to say like my mama said to me, what about him? What about him? Because you know what that was like as a kid. You wanted to compare it. Well, so-and-so gets to go. All of, they all go into the fair. How come I can't go? Well, you know, she had her own special way of being clear that she was my mama. <laughs> and that was her responsibility. And that all what these other people were doing, she was really curious about what made me think that was relevant. And so likewise, I, I want us to break that pattern of as we think about what we're called to do, to love, to lead, to yes. believe, that we are not bringing up visions of people who clearly aren't doing that. Mm. What about so-and-so? They don't seem to be doing it, and they have money, or they seem to be held there. We don't, I don't care, because you're not so-and-so. And we're talking about each of us as individuals. We're talking about our responsibility for ourselves. So in um, Dr. Daniel Morgan, y'all know we're, we're reading guidance for a spiritual journey. Well, for today, here's what he offers us. He says, no one is ever created without the inherent power in themselves to help themselves. Now, that's, that may be a surprise for some people. We're like, what? And it doesn't mean that we aren't, as humans, interdependent. But it means that the power is within you. So even if you come to me and we're in the coaching session, I don't have the power for your life. You have the power for you. It's inherent. You didn't get it when you, you know, went down the list to find who to call. You always had it. And you have it now, the inherent, always, in yourself, to help yourself. He says, there is a divine potency in every human. It's that notion of potentiality. It's there, but you're going to have to activate it. You have to do your part. He says, we must realize that life is more than the physical body. There is nothing too great of, of an accomplishment for the person who knows the power of his or her word and who follows their intuitive lead. Notice that that's an and. So you're not picking the parts you like. It's an and for the person who knows the power of their word. And that person has cleaned up what they're saying because they recognize... <clears throat> I apologize for hollering at y'all. <laughs> <clears throat> that person, at least in my life, when I realized decades ago, this was really a huge aha. I know y'all are way more advanced, so you probably haven't been through this. But there was a moment in time <clears throat> when I came to realize that the way that I spoke to me was violent and cruel. I would never, ever consider speaking to another human that way. But let me mess up. Let me have an intention and fall short of it. The way I would speak to me or of me I finally caught myself, but this is like what we were talking about at first, this idea of seeking it. I wanted to know what's going on in me. Yeah. And it was revealed to me the way I really saw me. If I achieved it, uh. 
I was all right. If I set the goal and I accomplished it, shh. But if I didn't, I just began to shrink. And now it didn't matter that others, they might not have been expecting it. It might not have had anything to do with anyone else. No one else could have weighed in on this. It was how I treated me falling short of my own goal. And I didn't know that that was true about me until I did. So I wasn't aware of the power of my word. Once I became aware of the power of my word, I used it differently. Now, I may slip up from time to time, but generally, the critical mass of how I speak to and about me is different. It's entirely different than it was those many decades ago when I was trapped in a way of beating me up, taking me out back and whipping me when I didn't meet my own intention, my own objective. Does this make sense? Now, I know this doesn't, it may occur to you one day that there's a little bit, I know y'all are way advanced though, so you're not, you're not, you're not anchored by this foolishness like I had been. But just let it be a cautionary tale. He says, Dr. Dan says, by our word we start in action, unseen forces. But look, I need you to know this. If you have not made friends with your word, you know, if y'all not hanging out, doing stuff together, if y'all not regularly, this isn't true about you. This isn't, I hadn't just spoken a word yesterday and this morning, and now I see in action unseen forces. It's like a critical mass. It's not a matter of time, so it's not like I would say, do it for two months and you're in. It's not that. But it's, it's a critical mass of you believing. It's a critical mass of you being there Always. It's unusual. When you find that you're not there, you're like, where am I? It's that. That's when you know that you're now in a different place. Is this making sense? Yeah. Okay, look at here. So he says that when you get to that point, by your word, you start in action um, to see the unseen forces. You start in action unseen forces and can rebuild your body. Now, until then, there are those who say that we have the wherewithal to walk on water. I'm going to say metaphorically, and if, you, if somebody is feeling like they want to put the bar high, higher, then go literally. But if you can't do it right now, you need a boat. <laughs> or at least some of those ski shoes, those ski boot things where you just, you need something. If you, do you see what I'm saying? I'm saying by right of consciousness. If you can't do that, you don't just go out on the water to prove you can't do it. And the, I mean metaphorically even. In your life, your work is on you. You are getting you to a point where your word means something to you. You know what I mean. For some of us, that, that's enough. Thank you, Reverend Andrea. That's enough. That's all I'm going to do right now because I, I can't take no more assignment. That assignment is going to keep me busy. Post the rest. I'll get to it later. Because this notion of having your word mean something to you. Yes. That's what this is talking about. It's a point of of who we are and how we are that is fueling this. And sometimes that's a challenge for what we teach because what we teach is true, but we often have not stopped to say, but it ain't gonna be true for you because you ain't doing nothing different. It is true. And you can speak to a mountain and say, be thy removed and it'll be removed, but that ain't happening for you because I see you ain't doing nothing different. All you're doing is trying to stump the teacher. 
And so we begin to reveal the pattern of how our lives got to be the way it is. And it typically, she's saying just so she don't have to say all the time, means we're not taking responsibility for our role. We think the fact that we've dusted our, fi our fingerprints off of it means that we're not responsible. It's like some CSI episode or something. This ain't that. This ain't that. He says it is therefore of the utmost importance to choose the right words. We don't even know the right words until we make friends with our highest consciousness. That's when the right word. Other than that, we just parroting stuff. We're just making up stuff to say. No offense. I'm not, you know, I'm just trying to clarify this. Do y'all understand what I mean? Okay. Because I'm largely talking to me anyhow. <laughs> I'm just pretending like it's not me. Uh, he says, the student, that's us, carefully selects the affirmation. He or she wishes to what? Catapult. So now you know there are many words to push, to place, to say. But this ain't that. He's saying to catapult into the invisible. So that's a choice of words that we're probably not speaking about ourselves yet. And that word must already be the equivalent vibration of who we are, how we're thinking, what we believe, in order for any of this to work. This is kind of, this is the, the, the backstory, if you will. Y'all are in the Wizard of Oz and you have gotten back in the back room now. You're like, what? <laughs> it's just, you just back here doing you? You just back here taking responsibility for you, that's all? It's not like magic and the rich people get it and the other people don't and, and the retribution, it don't have nothing to do with none of that? It's just me coming into an awareness of who I truly am. And then once I come into that, there's some stuff I'm not going to say anymore. There's some things I'm not going to do anymore. There's some places I ain't going and people I ain't going with. And no offense, but that's just how it works out. It's vibratory. I hate it when folks say it ain't personal, but it's ain't personal. It's vibratory. You won't be able to go. You'll be thinking, I'm going to go with them, and you ain't going with them because you can't. The vibration is too off. You may be headed there, but you ain't going to meet up with them because the vibration is off. Y'all can't do that anymore. All right, I know I'm going too far now. She like, she all up in my Kool-Aid and I need her to stop stirring. We know, Dr. Dan says, that God is our supply, that there is a supply for every demand, and that our spoken word releases this supply. Dr. Dan says we know it, but we don't. If we really look at the definition of no, we've heard it, we like the way it sounds, but we don't know it. Because if we knew it, it would be blowing up in our head. It would be blowing up in our heart. Our lives would be changing in it. So what he meant to say is, one day soon you may know it. It may come to you by and by. He says we must make the first move. Alice Walker and Destiny said we are the ones. We must make the first move. We're the ones responsible for the divine unfoldment of this. And then he offers us this affirmation. Dang. Okay, well, I'm up here now. I'm up here now, so let me go ahead and tell you this one Neville. I awakened this morning with Neville Goddard just blowing up in my head. The very first book of his that I read was your faith is your fortune. And I knew when I awakened this morning that Neville had a message for us. Well, here it is. Here it goes. 
He says, all conceptions are limitations of the conceiver. I should have brought my mic up here to draw. All conceptions are limitations of the conceiver. See, you, can't out, you cannot imagine beyond the divine blessing that's possible, that's already written on your life. You cannot imagine it. And so whatever you have conceived, your entire vision board does not compare. So what it's saying, whatever you have conceived of, and it's good, that's going to be part of our process. You conceiving your good, how you going to be? How you going to do? What you going to have? All of that. Just know that whatever you come up with, you can't outdo the full blessing, baby. You can't. You're not the one. So it's always going to be limited by your ability to conceive. And that's not a bad thing. I just want you to know what time it is. The time on our collective pattern, on our collective planet, is that you can't out-imagine the divine. But go ahead and imagine for you. Just know that this ain't the whole thing. You know how sometimes we'll imagine it, and then we'd be like, well, no, maybe, maybe not 10, just five. And we start trying to fix it. Just know you have already limited it. So you're trying to fix it from 10 to 5 is your eighth fix on it. Because you haven't begun to expand as far as what can be expanded when you get to the point of that. Oh, we got work to do, y'all. We're not nearly done. But look, we're getting ready to stop this. He also said... Only as you are willing to give up your present limitations and identify can you become that which you desire to be. So it's the onus is on you. Only as you are willing to give up your present limitations. You're going to have to let that go. And, a, and identity, your present limitations and identity, because they go together. They are just sides of the coin. Okay, y'all need to come up because you see I'm in trouble here. <laughs> Only as you are willing to give up your present limitations and identity, who you think you are, what you think you're worth, where you, all of that, can you become that which you desire to be? Let me give you this affirmation and then go sit myself down somewhere. Uh, Dr. Dan offers us this. Oh, I'm going to ask you to repeat with me. I'm going to say it, then you repeat. No, let's read it together. You see it up there. There you go. Let's read it together. Everybody, home, everywhere, out to brunch, all the things. Just do it. Today I declare that I am in tune with the infinite. I love my real responsibility, which is to keep myself in tune with divine law. I, within the sacred portals of my own being, determine what my individual responsibility is, and I honor it. And so it is. So look, we's all in need of prayer. The prayer that we would be our highest and best, that we would do what's required of us, that we would have a life that is reflected of that. What I know is that not just someone, everyone, I am in need of prayer today. You are in need of prayer today. We are in need of prayer today. Somebody's in need of prayer today.